a single man steps forward and says, I've killed over 600 people. And not only did I get away with it for 20 years, but it was easy. This statement captured the imagination of an entire country. But was it even true? Or is the truth even more fascinating and far more lucivious? We're telling that story tonight. What you are about to hear is believed to be real. Based on witness accounts, testimonies, and public record, this is Terrifying and True. As a child of the 80s, and really more so the 90s, Henry Lee Lucas was quite a legend. In many ways, he was the folk villain of America, a man who simply got on the highways of this great country and drove on and on and on, picking up women hitchhikers, killing them, and leaving them on the side of the road, and that was all it took for him to get away with it. I myself as a child were terrorized by thoughts of murder and mayhem thanks to the movie Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, as well as the less known and far more terrifying Confessions of a Serial Killer. This story has always fascinated me, and the truth behind it, I feel, is far more fascinating than the fiction. So we're going to dive into that story and all it entails after these quick words. One man, 600 murders. The numbers are staggering, and the brutality is unimaginable. But is it all true? Can one person really be responsible for so much death and destruction? Yes, we are talking about Henry Lee Lucas. His story is filled with textbook examples of serial killings, shocking pathological lying, and a trail of evidence that exposes just how flawed our justice system can be. So brace yourself as we take a bone-chilling ride into the twisted mind of one of America's most prolific and notorious serial killers. In the late 1950s, Henry was convicted as a burglar and already had a reputation in the criminal world. However, it wasn't until 1960 that he would become known to the public as a murderer. The victim of his heinous act? His own mother. But to better understand Henry and his actions, we need to explore his upbringing and personal background. It's clear that his childhood was anything but normal. Born in a one-room log cabin in Blacksburg, Virginia, Henry's life took a turn for the worst when he lost his left eye in a fight with his brother at the tender age of 12. From then on, he used his physical appearance to scare other children, making them tremble with fear. But it was his mother, Viola, who truly shaped Henry's twisted psyche a prostitute who forced her son to watch her engage in sex with clients. Viola would make Henry cross-dress in public so she could later pimp him out to men and women alike. As Henry grew older, his sexual deviance only grew more perverse. He began having sex with his half-brother and even the bodies of dead animals. It was clear that he was spiraling out of control. Henry's father, Anderson Lucas, died of hypothermia after drinking to intoxication and collapsing outside during a blizzard. Henry's first murder, if his account is to believed, was committed when he was just a teenager. He claimed that at age 14 or 15, he murdered 17-year-old Laura Burnsley when she denied his romantic advances. However, he later withdrew this confession. The law finally caught up to Henry in 1954 when he was sentenced to six years in prison for 12 counts of robbery. But even that couldn't keep him down. 
He escaped in 1957 only to be recaptured two days later and released in 1959. So it should be clear to everyone that Henry wasn't on very good terms with his mother for obvious reasons. She wanted Henry to come live with her and look after her as she grew older. In January of 1960, they were having an argument over this very issue. His mother hit him on his head with a broom. This made Henry furious. He picked up a knife, stabbed his mother in the neck, and then fled the scene. Henry's relationship with his mother had always been strained, but the argument they had in January of 1960 took things to a whole new level. After fleeing the scene of the crime, Henry was later arrested in Ohio. Henry's attempt to claim self-defense fell on deaf ears, and he was swiftly charged with second-degree murder. The court found him guilty, and he was sentenced to spend the next 20 to 40 years behind bars. But fate had other plans for Henry. Just 10 years into his sentence, the overcrowded prison system led to his early release in 1970. Just 18 months after his release, he found himself back in jail, this time for attempting to abduct three young girls. Following his release in 1975, Henry married one of his prison pen pals, but the marriage was short-lived. His stepdaughter made allegations of sexual abuse against him, and Henry left the marriage in shame. He moved to Jacksonville, Florida, where he met Otis Toole, another drifter, and they became friends and lovers. Soon they met Toole's niece, Frida Powell, who was just 10 years old at the time, and she and Henry became romantically involved. However, their relationship was indeed tumultuous. They often argued about their future plans. In 1982, they traveled to Ringgold, Texas, where they worked as hired hands for Kate Rich, an elderly woman. But when Rich accused them of cashing bad checks, they relocated to a religious commune called the House of Prayer in Stoneburg, Texas. Despite Powell's desire to return to Florida, Henry had other plans. He brutally murdered her and dismembered her body in an isolated field, leaving her remains undiscovered to this day. He then convinced Rich to come with him under the guise of searching for Powell, but he had other motives. He murdered Rich and hid her body in a drainage pipe in Ringgold. Despite his heinous crimes, Henry Lee Lucas remained living in Texas, continuing his life of crime. In 1983, he was taken into custody on an illegal weapons charge, which ultimately led to his confession of the murders of Kate Rich and Frida Powell. In a chilling videotaped account, Lucas described how he had brutally murdered Powell and dismembered her body, stuffing her remains into three separate pillowcases. Remarkably, the authorities were able to locate Powell's remains exactly where Lucas had told them to look. Lucas was found guilty of his crimes and received multiple sentences of 75 years and life imprisonment. The horrifying events we have recounted are a stark reminder of the depths of depravity that human beings are capable of sinking to. And while Henry's story is tragically all too familiar in the world of serial killers, what happens next will leave you shocked and even more horrified. By October of 1983, he declared that he had murdered 150 women in brutal sexual assaults during his hitchhiking travels through 17 states. This confession caused a media frenzy, cementing Henry's reputation as one of the most heinous serial killers in America. Additionally, he implicated Otis Toole as his accomplice in the crimes and accused him of being responsible for a 1982 fire that claimed a woman's life. Toole himself admitted to kidnapping and killing six-year-old Adam Walsh in 1981. For a little context, Adam Walsh was the six-year-old son of John Walsh, host of the legendary America's Most Wanted television series, 
a program which helped spread public awareness of fugitives from justice and led to over 1,190 captures. Adam Walsh's kidnap and murder led John Walsh to a lifetime of fighting for the victims of crime and helping them receive justice. Following the widespread reports in newspapers that Mr. Lucas had claimed responsibility for the murders of 100 and then 150 women, authorities convened a three-day conference. The conference brought together 85 law enforcement officers from 20 different states to untangle Mr. Lucas's statements and piece together the travel history of both him and Otis Toole. Investigators and participants in the conference revealed a disturbing story of two violent men from impoverished and turbulent backgrounds who crossed paths by chance. The pair traveled the country, picking up hitchhiking women, breaking into homes, and finding victims by any means they had access to. According to the conferees, they often stayed in campgrounds or other makeshift accommodations, constantly on the move and usually selecting victims with whom they had no prior relationship. At the time, the claim that Mr. Lucas had killed 150 women was viewed by some as a stretch to say the least. However, in the months that followed, he continued to confess to hundreds more murders. According to various sources, his total number of claimed victims eventually surpassed 600. This prompted law enforcement agencies across the country to interrogate Henry Lee Lucas, who was now a suspect in as many as 3,000 homicides spanning 40 states. Ultimately, his cooperation helped police close 213 murder cases. Sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? An article published in the New York Times in November of 1983 quotes Tom Whitlock, the lawyer representing Henry Lee Lucas in Denton, Texas, saying that, quote, I don't believe he's committed all the crimes they say he has, not 150. I have my doubts he killed 100. Certainly there's a temptation for law enforcement agencies to clear up their books this way. I'm getting too many calls from agencies who have a body and want somebody to blame it on. The same article mentions that Robin Frierson, the chief assistant public defender in Stewart, Florida, described Mr. Toole as being slow-witted and not someone who had the capacity to get away with a murder. Frierson further suggested that Otis was confessing to these crimes simply for publicity. At the height of the inquiry, these remarks were only unsubstantiated conjecture. Nevertheless, a significant breakthrough occurred nearly two years later as Henry retracted his confessions. According to a 1985 article in the Dallas Times-Herald, Henry claimed to have only killed three people, his mother in 1960, as well as Frida, also known as Becky Powell, and Kate Rich in 1982. The article also stated that Lucas admitted he would have ended the deception months earlier, but was warned that he would be immediately sent to death row at the Huntsville State Penitentiary if he did so. The newspaper quoted Mr. Lucas as saying the bogus confessions were intended to discredit law enforcement as, quote, really stupid. Quote, now we'll see who the real criminals are, Lucas stated. The newspaper further highlighted the discrepancies in Henry's initial confession spree. According to the authorities, Lucas allegedly drove a 13-year-old station wagon for 11,000 miles between October 2nd and November 2nd, 1978, during which he was accused of committing six murders and one attempted kidnapping. However, the newspaper pointed out that in the last four days of his journey, Lucas would have had to travel 4,100 miles, meaning he would have to have drived at an average speed of 50 miles per hour, even if he had not stopped to sleep. The mathematics simply did not add up. This report gives some credibility to the theory that law enforcement were using Henry's confessions as an easy way to close cases. The director of the Texas Department of Public Safety 
Colonel Jim Adams described the assertion of only three killings as ludicrous, noting that Mr. Lucas described as many as a hundred of the killings in exquisite detail. But Mr. Adams conceded that the authorities might have been too willing to accept the confessions that cleared unsolved killings. He said that Mr. Lucas frequently lied and had often given the police bad information. Attorney General Maddox also acknowledged how Lucas wasn't always truthful during the investigation. Maddox said that Lucas has now, quote, led us to believe that he did not commit a very large number of these crimes, and he clearly, quote, did not commit 600 murders. But the question arises as to why he lied in the first place. Henry Lee Lucas claimed that his false confessions provided him with certain privileges as a prisoner that he wouldn't have had otherwise. These privileges included being unrestrained during long journeys to various crime scenes, having the ability to order meals from fast food restaurants, and being able to walk freely through police stations at some stops. Lucas believed that his confessions were a result of a combination of tranquilizers, steaks, hamburgers, and milkshakes given to him by investigators, as well as clues from the crime scenes that he simply repeated back to detectives. Henry Lee Lucas had previously admitted to the murder of Laura Marie Purchase and was convicted for it in 1986. However, in 2007, the Sheriff's Office Cold Case Squad reevaluated the DNA evidence collected during the original investigation. Upon conducting a new analysis, both Lucas and his alleged accomplice Otis Elwood Toole were ruled out as potential suspects based on their own DNA samples. This serves as yet another instance highlighting the unreliability of Lucas's initial confessions. In 1984, Lucas was convicted for the rape and strangulation of a woman whose body, clad only in a pair of orange socks, was discovered in a ditch off Interstate 35 north of Austin. Despite confessing to the crime, Lucas later recanted and claimed that he had been lying. The validity of his confession was called into question by an investigation conducted by former Attorney General Jim Maddox, which raised doubts about Lucas's guilt. Records from Lucas's workplace and a cashed paycheck indicated that he may have been in Florida at the time of the murder on October 31, 1979, further casting doubt on his involvement in the crime. As a result of these doubts, Henry was spared from the death penalty in June 1998 after governor and future president George W. Bush accepted a recommendation from the state parole board. Instead, Lucas died in 2001 of a heart attack. At the time of his death, only three of the murders he confessed to were confirmed to be committed by him. While hundreds of cases were closed based on his confessions, even when he later recanted the majority of them, they were never reopened. In 2019, a documentary titled The Confession Killer was created by Robert Kenner, who found himself captivated by the case and committed to uncovering the truth. Quote, If we were to take a conservative estimate, 70 to 100 cases are still crediting Lucas for the crime, whether formally or informally probably 160 or 170 were never reinvestigated, which is an incredible number, said Kenner. While it is true that Henry was a morally corrupt serial killer, the motive behind uncovering the truth about his crimes is not to clear his name, but rather to provide closure for the families and friends of his victims. These individuals had previously believed that justice had been served, only to learn years later that the actual perpetrator may have never been held accountable for their own heinous acts. In a time before DNA evidence, it was very convenient for law enforcement to have a monster like Lucas to pin everything on, and Lucas loved to play along with whatever the mainstream account of his reality was. At one point, Lucas claimed to be a born-again Christian who had been co-opted by satanic cults, to commit murders. That story is equally fantastical, especially when you consider that the satanic panic of the 1980s 
was almost entirely fabricated. He had simply heard about it and added it to his own legend. In many ways, Henry Lee Lucas will always be the tall tale of serial killers, a Paul Bunyan of murder and carnage. I'm not going to lie, I don't like to pat myself on the back too often, but calling Henry Lee Lucas the Paul Bunyan of serial killers, well, I, I feel pretty proud of that one. That's one I came up with to tack on to the end of the program. But it's true. The man is a vicious, evil, bloodthirsty, tall tale. A man who did do heinous things, undoubtedly, but who became a scapegoat for a public desperate and hungry for answers. When terrible things happen to those you love, it's very hard to have no answers, no clues to find out the case has gone cold. Sometimes, a lie seems better than the truth. But, lies are never actually our friends. Lies simply misplace and offset the pain that we're trying to escape. I have fond and terrifying memories of renting Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer and Confessions of a Serial Killer from my local video store. Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer is the famous one, and it does not accurately depict Henry Lee Lucas much at all, but it does lean into his legend. Confessions of a Serial Killer, however, shows a lot about the cruelty, the animus, and the coldness of Henry Lee Lucas, and I recommend you check it out. Uh, I think you can rent it on Amazon. The most chilling moment for me was right at the end of the film, after Henry has confessed to murdering someone he loves and saying it's the only thing he's ever regretted. Then he calmly looks up at the police and he asks, Could I get another chocolate milkshake? <sighs> Gives me chills to this day. Terrifying and True is narrated by Enrique Couto. It's executive produced by Rob Fields. Produced by Daniel Wilder with original theme music by Ray Mattis. If you have a story you'd like us to cover on the program, send us an email at weeklyspooky at gmail.com. And if you want to support us in a very direct way, go to weeklyspooky.com and click on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you can support us and allow us to keep the spooky rolling and rolling and rolling. And I want to say a big thank you to our Patreon podcast boosters, folks who pay just a little bit more to hear their names at the end of the show. And they are Johnny Nix, Bobbletopia.com, Megan Hua, Julia Kirsch, Brent McCullough, Steve King, Karen Wiemet, Jack Kerr, and Craig Cohen. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time right here on Weekly Spooky and Terrifying and True.